So our, our final speaker, last but certainly not least, is Cody Tromberg. Cody is a senior farm bill biologist with Pheasants Forever, based out of Baldwin, Wisconsin. But he covers an area, a big area, I know that from having worked with him, uh, Pierce, St. Croix, Polk, Burnett, Washburn, Barron, and Dunn counties. He's been in his current role for the past eight years and works to help private landowners achieve their wildlife habitat goals through technical assistance and conservation programs offered through the state, federal, and local programs, such as the Conservation Reserve Program, CRP, as you probably have heard it referred to, Environmental Quality Incentives Program, EQIP, Pheasants Forever, and um, different incentives that Pheasants Forever chapters provide. Uh, Cody primarily works on native grassland reconstruction, shrub plantings, brush management, and wetland restoration to improve wildlife habitat, soil health, and water quality. So welcome, Cody. <laughs> I'm thinking Lori had a good idea. We're, we're recording it by sure. via this iPhone, so if you want to stand kind of close to that. I might face. So I get the luck of being last. So everybody's already said stuff that I'm going to talk about and being right before lunch and nobody wants to listen, right? <laughs> so we'll go through this. It's not definitely going to be a 20 minute presentation. I know some of it's already been discussed, but I'm curious to see what everybody's thoughts are at the end, kind of after hearing yeah. everybody, you know, and what maybe next steps can be, that sort of thing. So um, the title there you can ignore because um, I got to sign that because I was late on my presentation. <laughs> yeah. we'll, try, we'll try. We'll try. We'll try and hit most of the points. So. Okay, sorry about that. No, it's all good. It's all good. So road types for wildlife, um, you know, safes or sinks, uh, kind of one of the topics we throw around a lot with colleagues is, you know, there's such small habitats for like from a pheasant standpoint or a bird standpoint, like is it actually beneficial or is it not? I mean, think about driving down the road. How many coons do you see laying on the road dead? How many skunks, you know, all those nest predators are using those travel corridors. So is it good or is it bad? You know, we throw that around all the time. But I think as Hardy said too, the, uh, the research is showing that in certain areas up to a third of the pheasant production can come from roadsides, especially in heavily ag dominated landscapes where there just isn't um, a lot of unbroken grass on the habitat around. So it is, it is very important. Um, I didn't have a number for Wisconsin, and uh, our first presenter did talk about, you know, about 1,500 acres in roadsides and county roads in Pierce County alone. I think he's probably low on that with right away widths and distances. But there's over 500,000 acres of roadside habitat just in Minnesota's Pheasant Ridge. So that's the size of Dane County. Um, that's a lot of, lot of habitat for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but like we talked about with the sinks, you know, there are a lot of obstacles to good habitat. There's predation in the corridors, you know, ATV traffic's becoming a big thing, people riding in the, the road ditches, recreational mowing, you know, it's not all just on the county or the towns that are kind of out there doing that sort of thing. So just keep that in mind, you know, I'm burning my shirt, so I gotta talk about that to begin with, and we'll come back to it here in a little bit. So mowing management, um, I think that's probably the most common thing that the towns are doing right now. Um, and it's important, right? We gotta have a mowing, we gotta have that safety. Um, that safety zone cleared, you gotta have to do some sort of mowing. It all comes down to, are you mowing at the wrong time to directly kill that wildlife? And are you mowing more than you need to? Um, a lot of ways to say that on that point, so you can go back to How do we manage it? You know, reduce mowing that entire area. And you see that, what I'll refer to that as what John was talking about, that recreational mowing. I don't think as many towns or counties are doing that anymore. It's just not financially smart for them to be out there mowing three times a year from ditch to fence sort of thing. But it's a lot of the landowners that are doing it. They're being hay, they're being mowed, they just like that clean look. And that's a hard, hard argument to have, right? Like we can't just go to the town board and say, hey, stop mowing this. And they look at us and say, it's not us. Um, so that'll be something we'll have to get over. Uh, mowing the roadside beyond that clear zone, so that first 15 feet is what they were talking about earlier. Some places it's six, some places it's 15, just depends on what their mower width is. Um, and then we kind of have to do that. We have a state that has a huge amount of deer collisions. Um, you got to be able to see the intersections, clear zone. Um, it's pretty important. But trying to mow outside of that as infrequently as we can. Um, and then 
kind of that, that mowing that clear zone, the research is showing that people like that, it's nice, and then they accept the more messy stuff outside of it. So kind of a give and take on the dish. But this is kind of a depiction of that. Hopefully everybody's kind of made sense of that by now, but that clear zone is that first, this is the interstate, so it's about 30 feet. You know, on town roads, county roads, it's probably 15 feet. On town roads, it might be six or eight feet, just depending on what your motor width is. Outside of that, you know, we're gonna be selective, try and leave it as much as we can, and then on big roadways, you can probably leave an area natural outside of that, or in Wisconsin, it's gonna be woods. So. Um, adjusted mowing schedules. Wisconsin's native plants, typically April or May through September. They have them. Mowing during that not only impacts the plants itself, you know, stops regrowth, um, directly impacts pollinators, directly implants those wildlife species that are going to be nesting in those those roadways as it's growing at that point in time. So come back to my, my favorite bird, best case scenario. Um, pheasant nests usually initiate around May, May 1st, we'll say. They lay somewhere between 11 and 15 eggs, so we'll call it 12, that's May 13th. Maximum incubation of 28 days, that's June 10th. And three weeks to be flight ready enough to get out of the way of a mower. That's July 1st, best case scenario. Then you take nest, nesting success is 40 to 60%, and the amount of time that we just described above for them to need to re-nest, it's pretty easy to see why we'd like to see August 1st as a delayed mowing day. Um, so our first presenter said, Unfortunately, the state of Wisconsin mandates July 15th as the date that they should be done. I'd certainly love to see July 15th as the date that they would start instead of being done. Um, you know, mowing, if they're starting in May to get done with the county, county work beforehand and be able to mow the state land before uh, July 15th, uh, there's a lot of birds that are getting hit there. Um, so, go ahead on that one. I was pretty excited to hear that the county was implementing flush bars, so, though. So this is one of the practices that we've actually promoted even in hay, hayland. Um, you know, with hanging those chains out front, uh, if you can get birds up off that nest, you might be destroying that nest, but they still have a chance to re-nest uh, and produce a, a clutch if you're not taking out the hand themselves. So that's kind of cool. Um, utilize spot mowing. I mean, everybody's kind of talked about it, right? You know, this implemented integrated pest management. We can't just be mowing the whole thing, but we still have the basics to manage. We still have woody species. We're gonna have to spot mold, we're gonna have to do things like that. You know, try and do it when when species are less active. Don't go mow at the first light when the bees are super active or when it's super cold and they're they're not sort of that, you know, that's timing. Um, modal height of 10 inches, you know, what do we need it? A turf grass lawn high two inch ditch for, even in a clear zone. You know, if it's eight inches high, I'm gonna be able to see a deer standing there. <laughs> you know, if it's, if they're a little bit bigger than that. Even a metal mark, maybe you could possibly, see Possibly, possibly, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, to provide cover and it's faster regrowth. Um, if you cut a plant down, if you cut your lawn down about two inches, uh, every time you cut something super short, it actually takes energies from its root system to regrow that plant and the roots get shorter. And so then you talk about erosion control, right? Johnny, you were mentioning that before. So your roots get shorter every time you mow it, then you have more chance of erosion. So there's kind of a double edge on doing some of this stuff. But, not to mention the carbon load. Yeah, carbon fuel. Uh, I'm not a herbicide expert, so you did ask to talk about herbicides. I threw something in here. I'm not going to talk about it a whole lot. <laughs> um, you know, we know there, there's some, some pesticide issues with pollinators, with things like that, but there's also those invasive species we have to control. This is a sheet that I got from a roadside tour probably three or four years ago that they did in Dunn County and St. Croix County when they were doing a lot of selective spray in a certain a few townships for um, parts of the fortune or for things that are a big problem. Because it's really hard to say, hey, let's manage a really good roadside here. Let's not mow until August 1st. And then all of a sudden all the parsnip seeds out and we drag the mower down the road and we drag all the parsnip with it. Well, yeah, we saved a few birds, but now we just spread a whole bunch of invasive species. So it's like, Where's the balance right. right here? Maybe we have to do a little bit of slight spring so that we can do a later mowing, um, things like that. So yeah. that was the one point I'm going to make on herbicides. Yeah. It's, well, and I think also I threw that in there just because with, when we thought, talk about money, yeah, and the, money, it's expensive. I don't remember who mentioned it. If it was, I think it might have been Chad, the first presenter, was the growth uh, regulator. So this, a lot of the stuff that they're spraying up there, that MSO, is a, a herbicide with the growth regulator. 
And when they did that, they sprayed for parsnip uh, early in the spring. And they sprayed a growth regulator on it. And what actually happened is it stunted the bromine enough that they didn't have to mow that first mowing. And we actually saw milkweed and the native plants <laughs> come up through it because they actually never made it late enough to dig in the back. Oh, so it's kind of yeah, interesting. Yeah, timing is everything. Yeah. yeah. So, um, that's what we love to see, right? We all love to see like native roadside circle thing. Um, we just talked about it though, it's expensive, right? So maybe targeting it when there's road construction, you know, versus going in there and killing and trying to partnership that sort of thing. Um, apologize, the slide got a little, little clustered there, but um, native grasses are, are adapted. They have long root systems. There's not gonna be erosion concerns with that. Uh, um, they're long lived. So John, you were talking about building roads that last longer, right? Well, what do we want to have shitty road ditches that aren't going to last long in the road if the road feels so good that it's going to last longer? Um, you know, establish diverse communities, um, suitable cover for erosion, improve weed erosion control, improve weed uh, suppression. Natives are pretty tolerant to stuff. I mean, you get a nice native stand out there, you're not having much of disturbance in it, you're not going to have as much invasive species problems as you do um, constantly going or maintaining things. Um, all on your benefits. I don't think anybody said it, but how many, what's the average percent of your food do you think comes from pollinators? 90? Jerome, don't, say, don't answer my question. Oh, <laughs> what did Jerome say? I told him not to answer my question. Yeah. Oh. One in every three bites had something to do with a bee, so. Not including crops. Not including crops. For, for animals, if you include that, then it's two in every three. There you go. Wow. So at minimum, one in every three. <laughs> um, so it's kind of an important thing that we've been overlooking, right? And I don't want to be like trying to hand pollinate stuff, so let's let's put some pollinators in our road ditches. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we can go to the next one. So the, the takeaways, you know, road sides can be beneficial if they're managed correctly. We all I think, agree on that. Um, establishing native Vegetation would be great, but it's expensive, so we got to find the right time and place to do it. Hopefully, that's starting some new construction. Uh, utilize that adaptive management. You know, look at those nesting seasons. Try and do the BMPs for pollinators. Uh, watch for bloom periods. You know, if we can get out there and do some early milling, we're not necessarily impacting nesting. We're not impacting blooming, and then we can come back later and hit it at the end of the year after things are are done. Uh, and then control the invasive species. That's probably one of our biggest problems right now. Is, we have a lot of invasive species and they're really hard to control. So mm -hmm. I think that's all I have. Yeah, do you have any questions for Cody? I have, I have a comment. Sure. So um, some of the DNR biologists in Minnesota were taking a look at where deer in particular were foraging along roadsides and um, what they liked was the fresh new grass that was cut. I've, I've seen that, and I've also seen a study that shows that if there's actually that outside of the clear zone, if there's the taller vegetation, then there's actually some studies say that deer are less likely to bolt, which actually reduces car collisions because they feel more secure in there. Right, so, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Good point. So the conclusion is, you know, that if you mow right next to the road, that's where deer are going to want to eat the fresh new grass. Yeah. <laughs> It's just popular. Any other questions? <laughs> Go ahead. So, you listed all these pretty simple sounding alternatives for the DOT to implement, like the mowing heights and stuff. How much has your group coordinated or attempted to coordinate with them on that stuff? So, in Wisconsin, we have had a large footprint on things. Um, President Sparber did just hire a right away an energy coordinator. Um, so they were trying to get into this game a little more because we know there's you know, 500,000 acres in Minnesota alone. Um, but I think it's it's more small groups here and there. Um, in Illinois, was the example we had, but the river does have a program down there. Um, we're, we're entering the phase in discussions, but not there yet. I'm just wondering, you, you touched on uh, the higher uh, or selective height mowing, the taller mowing. Has that been done enough to see that there's, that introduces any kind of selective breeding? In other words, by topping certain plants, you know, shorter plants will thrive. In, I mean, is, 
Have you ever been looked at? Uh, it's the general guidance when you're doing native restorations when we're doing mowings that we mow high. Yeah. Um, beyond that, I don't have research to back, back anything like that. Uh, but like if we do prairie reconstructions, prairie restorations, you know, usually those first couple of years, especially, it's going to be really weedy, and yeah. you're trying to mow high enough just that everything else can come up underneath it. Um, and then also, we were talking about that root system, right? So if you mow things too short, it pulls the energy from the roots, and the roots start to get shorter. It takes a lot longer to regrow. It's kind of like talking about a lot more in grazing systems than they probably do in hay and mowing. Um, but if you take half, leave half, you'll get a lot faster regrowth out of everything. So. So are you saying that you're not sure if that high mowing is affecting birds or not? I, Nasty birds. I would expect it probably is. And, and so the question to him was, are those shorter, I mean, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but the shorter grass species or other plants that are going to... Yeah, yeah they, they, uh, push, they, push it your, seems like there's a possibility you, you may get a crop of shorter plants less in I think it's gonna be, I think it's gonna more be on the timing of when you mow and what species are in your mix yeah. than it is necessarily the height. Yeah, timing is everything. It really is. It is uh, obviously it's a seasonal thing, but is uh, burning a practical uh, approach to roadside? It's a fantastic uh, management tool. How practical it is. No, I mean for roadsides, obviously yeah. for, for prairies and so forth. I think it's pretty challenging. Yeah. So um, Iowa has it down, but I haven't seen it. I would say, you know, I always feel like the interstates or like your larger highway complexes are would be pretty easy, right? You got blocked yeah. off on two sides and you yeah. got a median, you know, like it's not gonna go anywhere. You start talking about the like county roads, town roads, what's adjacent to it becomes the problem, right? How do you put a fire break between the ditch and the woods or the ditch and the neighbors sure. crop fields sort of thing? It's yeah. pretty challenging. So. <laughs> Yeah. So I got a question maybe for each of you. So if they do rebuild the road, okay, all your ditches are completely tore up because you're rebuilding the ditches at the same time. What do they typically do then? Do they go in with Roundup for two years to because they're full of weeds, invasives and everything. I mean, when you're going to redo the roadside ditch and try to keep the weeds out, I mean, I know in prairie management they'll have you put, you know, glyphosate uh, resistant corn, soybeans in for a year or two and stuff. What are they recommending for that then? Good question. I would think you should be able to get it. It's completely tore up in dirt. I would let it green up and spray it with Roundup and I'd seed it. That's what I was wondering too. I see it. There, there are seed mixes that are designed specifically for removal side mm -hmm. installations that are really heavy on grasses and they include some competitive cover crops like yep. rye in there right. and oats. Um, so that first year, it's, it's a lot of um, of those competitive, you know, cover crops, mm -hmm. tall rye, oats, and then they come in and mow usually mm -hmm. right before they're going to go to seed. Right, right. Yeah, you almost throw the mowing dates out for nesting and everything the first couple of years during right. the prairie establishment anyways, because you've got to get it established. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so I was wondering, in years past, they've used stuff like bird's foot tree foil and crown vetch for, no. uh, I know it's horrible, <laughs> but are, they, are, are, big, are states doing that in big areas? I don't think that one's being used as much anymore. Vetch might still be. He's like it. There, there is some farmers <laughs> well, that are used for under cover crops, oh, but states in large aren't are considered that one. Tree foil is still being used in, in hayland plantings in Wisconsin and some areas. Yeah. yeah. Like 25 years ago when we had a pond structure put in, our, the people who did that at that point were using birds with tree foil to hold the sides, and it did a great job, but gosh, it's it's so hard to get rid of. Tree foil is still accepted, but um, vetch is not in terms of, um, you know, seed mixes. But regenerative farmers are still using vetch heavily for cover crops mm -hmm. successfully. You know, you mean there, there are also. Uh, oh. Okay. Yeah. So we use carry vetch all the time. Yeah. Crown vetch is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. But I remember when they started using crown veg instead of just mowing it, I thought, what a great idea. Because it was, it seemed like progress <laughs> from, from my <laughs> Well, making the size of the freeways into golf courses, now they had flowers, but now we know more. Right. So, 
you raise a really good point, Reen, because I was thinking um, as Cody was talking, and you know this from working with youth USDA um, over the you know my quarter of a century of sort of tracking some of their initiatives. They you know you our initiatives. Um, they have had various things that they've promoted, like multi-flora rows, <laughs> you know, some of these things that we later realize are highly invasive um, and trouble. They're trouble, and, then, and so at one point, literally in my lifetime, I remember the promotion of multi-flora rows, and then I remember seeing bumper stickers, kill the rows, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, it, it, there is a sort of con well, well, basically we really, learn, right? We learn. It's a from, really good conversation to have. Right. And, um, invasive is a funny term. Yeah. I think you know, un unwanted might be more accurate because these plants are surviving in conditions that are atrophic soil, right? Mm -hmm. So they're opportunistic, and if the soil is more healthy then you would have more biodiversity, but it's kind of a vicious cycle. And there's some plants that, you know, you have to weigh out, like, are you gonna use a poisonous, you know, pesticide that's gonna contaminate your water quality, get rid of knapweed? Well, not really sure if that's worth it. Knapweed's also very good for pollinators. And then thistle is, one of the best plants for birds, right? They eat the seed all winter long, and people don't know there are six species of thistle that are native and mm -hmm. don't spread. They just think Canada thistle, right? Right. right. So, right. or the biennial, the musk thistle, and the nose. But well, I got one I, last question. Yeah, one last question. Uh, I was going to try. Pheasants forever, right? Yeah. Why don't I see more pheasants? What is the number one reason we have tons of habitat around here? It, the only pheasants I ever see are dead on the road. There's almost no, I haven't seen a clutch of pheasants Come in the to my farm. So I just, in this I just I don't be sponsored by where are you, where are you looking for me? And you know, where are you? I mean, the pheasants are out there. There's pheasants are not here. I mean, I drive the whole township all the time. And I'm just curious, right? I mean, I'm down by the Trim Bell. I never, I almost never see a pheasant down there. I would say tons of habitat is in exaggeration of the amount of habitat that we have. Mm -hmm. um, grassland habitat is probably the biggest limiting factor, but in this part of the country, it's yeah. probably also winter cover. So, you think so, winter so, so, so yeah. the, the border of St. Croix and Polk County is the number one producing spot in the state for wild production of birds mm. right now. Uh, you think about up there, it's all, you know, there's a lot of fish and wildlife, grass, large grassland complexes, um, DNR land, that sort of thing. But what lacks up there, the, you know, compared comparatively to like South Dakota or something mm -hmm. like that, is there's not giant cattail sleuths. There's not that winter cover. You know, where you see them in Pierce County a lot of times, uh, it's roadways <laughs> that, that are managed fairly decent, associated with a wetland or you know something that's kind of that odd farm area. But there isn't those larger blocks of grass. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably where it's coming. Kind of there's really also good. research being done. Um, at the University of South Dakota and Blue, forgetting the name of the agricultural research farm, but they, they were looking at deer originally and at spleens that were collected to see neonicotinoid and systemic insecticide contamination and how that was affecting birds. And they've now, ex or deer, they've now expanded in the last couple of years to look at pheasants and some other grassland birds and also wild foraging mammals like fishers and otters to see what they're ingesting and how much contamination are mm -hmm. in their, um, their organs. But they did a control study with pheasants, ring-necked um, pheasants, and determined that at a low level lower than what birds were exposed to from, say, neonicotinoid coated corn seed that they were eating and other water and so on that was contaminated. At a lower level, their control of pheasants, um, I'm forgetting the percentage, but their egg efficacy went down 40%. So, they, the eggs would not go to fruition. 
um, and they had less chicks, and the older kids were getting sick and not lean, so there's that going on. And there's a study online, I can give you the... Were you thinking of Greenland's Blue Waters? Uh, John, Dr. Jonathan Jenks and Longgren did a, a couple of talks online about okay. ring neck pheasants. And are you familiar I've with I've seen the study, I don't remember the details of it. Yeah. Great, well, I would like to um, wrap up the sort of formal part of this, if we can think of this as a formal conversation and encourage us to continue our conversations over lunch. But first, I'd love to have a round of applause for our speakers. Mm -hmm.